Joining us on the panel, the, the local ball players who made our area their home after playing days were over. Again, Joel Bennett, born and raised in Windsor, pitched in the big leagues with the Orioles and the Phillies. And uh, currently is scorekeeper Steve Crayley, member of the 53 World Champion Yankees, and Tom Whiteman, who won nine games for the Eastern League Championship BMets. Connor Gates, Community of Community, Director of Community Relations for the BMets. Let's start off things here, talking about postseason play. BMets just wrapped up their third Eastern League title in its 23-year history. Let's think back to your playing careers, guys. Except for you, Connor. <laughs> We'll take back to your pony days as the hot dog ponyman. <laughs> Tom, what are your fondest memories of that 92 inaugural season, playing along guys like Bobby Jones and Brooke Fortis? How about it? Uh, well, first of all, playing with uh, Bobby Jones and Brooke Fortis. Bobby Jones was an incredible guy. He was a first round pick the year before. Um, came in and, and any time he was starting for us, we knew all we had to do was score one or two runs and, and we were going to win the ball game with Jonesy. Fordyce, uh, you know, defensively was very solid behind the plate. Um, probably the biggest thing with Brooke, when there was a runner in scoring position, he got the hit to drive the guy in. I mean, I think for an average, he probably hit 250, 260 in his career, but always had big RBI numbers because he was uh, the guy who got the big hit for us. Um, my fondest memories of Binghamton, uh, I'm, my wife's not here, so obviously I'd have to say her, meaning her, but <laughs> my, uh, probably one of my best memories is every time coming to the ballpark that year, and I know it was the first year of baseball here, it was packed, and it was exciting, and, and you, to get excited for the ball game, you didn't have to do anything yourself because the fans were into the ball game immediately, and, and it made it fun for us. And, and then anytime we went out to eat or wherever we went, people would know, hey, you're with the Binghamton Mets, and notice you and recognize you, and that was always great because we had fans all the time, so they'd see out. So that was, that was a couple great things about the season. All right. Thank you very much. All right, Joel. You won the Independent League Championship 2004 with the Jackals. You stayed up for 24 consecutive hours as you drove to Massachusetts, clinched, clinched and then drove back to attend to your duties as school teacher. What do you remember about that exhausting day? Nothing. Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. Uh, Mike Bertotti was a teammate of mine. Uh, he had been in the big leagues with the White Sox. And he pitched game one. Lefty threw hard. And we lost three to two, I think. He struck out 14, had a great game. We lost that night. I take the ball the next night. And uh, we lose two to one. I had 15 strikeouts. Went eight innings, I think. So teary-eyed, I'm shaking everybody's hand on the dugout because they're going now to Lynn Mass. I have to start school on Monday because <laughs> I'm a teacher. So I shake everybody's hand, I'm hugging everybody, and you know, good luck, but thinking reality is, you know, it's over. So Saturday night, my manager calls me about 12.30, so we won in 12 innings. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. He goes, I use like four pitchers, no, no, no. Sunday he calls me, we won in 12 innings. I'm like, Joe, that's incredible. I got nobody left. I used every pitcher. He's literally crying. I need you. He's on the bus with the guys. And I can hear the guys in the background yelling, come on, no, no, no. And he's crying, well, come on, man. I need you. Please, you got to. I'm like, Joe, I got to go to school in the morning. It's, it's 8.30 on Sunday evening. What do you want me to do? I said, there's no way. He goes, please. He's just begging. So I said, I called my principal, explained the situation. He said, look, just take a personal day and go get it done. So I called him back. And, all, and the bus just went nuts because he, he's coming and they all freaked out. So we got in the car, my wife and I, uh, my in-laws were taking care of the kids, getting them on a bus to go to school. So she did the lion's share of the driving, I'm remembering going up there. Because I handled stress the day pitching of, I got really tired now, you know, take naps and stuff. So she drove the way up there. Uh, we got up there, guys were going crazy, they were so excited, through seven innings. Uh, we ended up winning, it was insane. Celebrated in the locker room, and got in the car and drove home. <laughs> uh, we got home about, like he said, 5.30 in the morning, and you know, just adrenaline, adrenaline rush, and uh, took a shower, got dressed, and went to school the next morning, and uh, you know, an hour later, and it was just an incredible, incredible day. Something I never imagined was gonna happen. Uh, like I said, just shook everybody's hand, say goodbye, and next thing you know, I'm, you know, holding up a, a trophy. It was an incredible day. That's something I'll never forget, that's for sure. That's awesome. All right, Connor. 
this season was one heck of a season. I had to, I was very, I, I really appreciate the fact that I got to do a game, got to watch. If you haven't seen Connor work a game in his operations, he's, uh, he's really good at what he does. And I know as part of the B-Sense when we won in 2011, I, I, you know in the season, there's a specific spot in the season where you just go, oh my gosh, there's something special here. Wow, Connor, when was that this year? As uh, part of direct, being director of community relations, at the beginning of the season, I get to address the team, basically give them a reason to hate me every time I come in the clubhouse. It's either to get something signed or to get someone to go out into the community for an appearance. So, you know, it's kind of like when Dracula comes into the room. <laughs> uh, but it was that first meeting that I realized that this was going to be a little bit, I mean, last year, don't get me wrong, was unbelievably exciting. Um, I, I almost feel like, uh, well, I definitely feel like last year was going to be the team that we finally, you know, we finally locked a championship. Obviously, Trenton had different plans. Um, so, but the guys who came back from last year's team definitely had unfinished business when it came to this season. And Pedro uh, had the meeting with the players beforehand. I was fortunate enough to be able to sit in on it. And he, that's when he gave the phrase that kind of lasted throughout the playoffs, and that was six more wins. And uh, once I heard Pedro say that's all he wanted to win was six more, I'm like, I, I'm like, let's let's shine up the trophy and get it ready for Binghamton right there. And uh, I will say this team was uh, over the many years that I've worked with the team, this team was the most consistent and uh, easily the most driven team that we've had uh, since I, since I've been involved with the team now for 17 years. So I knew this was <laughs> these guys weren't going to stop. They were going to go as, as hard as uh, as hard as they could. And uh, much like everybody here in Binghamton, once we fell down two to one against Portland, I got nervous. But I knew this was definitely the kind of team that would come back, pull out the extra the two more wins in Portland that we needed. And once we beat them, no doubt in my mind, I knew we basically started getting ready for a championship celebration right there. And uh, having grown up in Binghamton, seeing Tom play in '92, uh, being with the, uh, watching both the win in '94, can't imagine, can't imagine it going any other way. This was a great year, and uh, you know, I hopefully these guys come back ready to win a second one when they get back here in April. I'm going to kind of veer from the script here because I, I really want to get the same thing from Steve because I know you know the game inside, outside, upside down, backwards, and I want to know what point of the season this year you went, oh yeah, these, these guys got it. Play the told, excuse me, Pedro, that uh, when, uh, I've been here ever since uh, 92 doing the, the official scorekeeper for the big of the Mets. And what I've seen from 92 all the way to 2014, and this team is a replica really of 92 when they first won it here also, the Eastern League Championship. Uh, what I predicted was this team this year, when they went out of road, if you always followed them when they played out of road, when they were behind like four runs, five runs, they came from behind and they won the game. Once you do that as a ball club, your pitching gets uh, up steam a little bit, and your hitters get up steam a little bit, your fielders are great, they'll make all kinds of fantastic plays. So from the first half, they were so-so, but the second half, they went through the line so good that I predicted that eventually they won't win it all. Now you take the playoffs, I think it was tremendous when they went <coughs> One and all against Portland, then they went to Portland, they had a win there, okay, because they couldn't come back home because Portland had home field advantage. So when you see a team do that, and the pitchers come in, they did their job, and especially here at the last game, Matt's tremendous. His control was there, his follow through was there, he had confidence in himself, you could he could have probably threw his glove out on the mound, and you knew that the day of the Mets were gonna win. But I give a credit to the coach. Uh, Pedro, I went after the game and I shook his hand. I said, I want to say one thing to you. I admire what you did because your players look up to you. The manager is a key. The coaches are key. Pitching coach, especially for a pitcher, like we're all pitchers who are sitting at this table. 
And there's a flaw sometimes when we go to the mound that uh, we don't see it, they see it, but the most important person that does see it is your catcher. He knows whether I have good stuff or I don't have good stuff. So I'm proud of the team this year. I was proud of them last year. I think that uh, they went a little flat to the playoffs and they got wiped out. But this year they learned something from last year. Pedro learned something from last year. So when you put it all together, you become champions. It's no different that uh, even with the New York Yankees, it's the same formula. All the years that they won. And that's what it takes to be a champion, really. I'm proud to be here with the BMATs as official scorekeeper for 22 years now. And a lot of people don't understand scoring in the first place. They think that uh, if the ball hits the uh, outfielder's glove, it, it, he goes from uh, his regular position to left center, right center, they think it should be an error, but it's not. Because you get the benefit of doubt because he had to leave his position to try to field the ball, he can't get it in time, the, the ball drops. So you don't give an error, you give a hit to the bat. But I enjoy it. Uh, I don't have that much problem with the managers of every team because I think I'm doing no good, uh, even if they talk to me, because it's their opinion against my opinion. And I, I'm the only one that could change it. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, we have uh, we have some more questions here. Uh, let's see here now. Joel won two games for the '99 Phillies and the uh, Ace and the Ace of the staff uh, that year was Kurt Schilling. 15 wins. Paul Bird won 15 games as well. They help you out at all? I still talk to Paul, great guy. Schilling was a guy who was more prepared for a game than anybody I've ever seen. And me partially being clueless and not knowing who I was talking to and the other part wanting to learn, he had, uh, someone had a computer program for him. Every game was videotaped, put on CDs, so he could click on a date, at bat, pitch, and go to that pitch. So he would study the hitters he was gonna throw against. And he was getting ready to throw against the Colorado Rockies. And he's at his, this is hours and hours before the game. He's sitting there and he's watching this stuff, and I'm like in the back watching, I, not thinking when I'm said, can I watch this? And he's looking at me like, getting ready for a game. And he's like, yeah, man, pull up a chair. So he's watching the hitters, and he's studying how they're reacting to pitches, and just sitting and talking to him, it was amazing. And I was an American League my whole year, my whole career, until I went with the Phillies. So it's DHs, everybody's a hitter, nationally, Eight and nine guys, you got your pitcher hit ninth, and he was talking about how to set up innings, which wasn't a part of my vocabulary because everybody hits in the American League. So I remember getting having up, getting roughed up one inning, and he comes and he sits, actually puts his arm around me, and he goes, he goes, what were you, what were you thinking there? I'm like, well, I'm trying to, da 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 da, get him out. He goes, look, 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 you got to get through the eight and nine guys. You want the number nine hitter leading off the inning. You don't want to start with the top of the lineup coming up, and and I'm thinking. Wow, it's things that I had never thought about because everybody's a hitter in the American League and not so in the National League. So little things like that that he took the time as a 29-year-old rookie from nowhere that he didn't know would take the time for me was incredible. Paul Bird, which is a perfect name for him because he's out there. He's out there. So what I learned from Paul Bird was uh, have fun with the game. Have fun with the game. I'll never forget one day, Mike Liebenthal was our catcher. And he's like, Joel, he's schizophrenic. I swear to God, I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, he'll give you a sign, and you'll throw a pitch, and he'll look at you like, what'd you just, and he'll forget what sign he gives you. I'm like, come on, Paul, there's no way. So I'm in Colorado, my first major league start pitching. I got Larry Walker on first base, just ripped the change up through the hole, whatever. He's on first. So I'm looking in for my sign. He gives me a sign, and... I shake it off, he goes another one, so I start to come set and I step off the mound because he just had come out to the mound and talked to me about, because now we're facing Dante Bichette. So I'm facing Dante Bichette, he's telling me how we're going to pitch him, and he goes back behind the, the thing and he throws down a totally different pitch that we just talked about. So I step off, I look in the dugout, and here's Paul Bird like, <laughs> I told you, you know, I told you. So I'm just shaking my head like, wow. 
maybe he is. So just funny things like that that I'll never forget. I mean, Kurt taking the time when he didn't need to, and Paul just teach me that, you know what? I remember sitting with him one time before the game. He had just pitched, I had just pitched. We had nothing to do that night. He goes, let's go watch a big league ball game. You know, and just grab me by the shirt and out we go. So that kind of thing I'll never forget for Paul. And uh, Kurt just, he talks and he is who he is. But uh, I'll tell you what, I got a lot of respect. A lot of respect for Christian. All right. Thank you very much. Tom, talking about bonding with pitchers. Uh, you had some great pitchers on the 92 team, uh, including Bobby Jones, Joe Bitko, Pete Walker, name a couple. Tell us about the experiences that you had with them. Uh, oh, great. First of all, like I said, uh, Bobby Jones was a special player, um, and, and you knew it immediately, just the way he carried himself around the locker room in spring training prior to us getting there and everything. You, you just knew he was a special player. So I always used to stand back, like Joel was saying he did with uh, Schilling, I would stand back and watch Bobby uh, go through his routine in the bullpen. What is he doing? Okay, these are, why are you doing that? You know, I was very inquisitive myself and would ask a lot of questions or always watch people. Um, but uh, he, he was a special person. Joe Vitko um, was a different person by far. He was 6'8", six, eight. Six, eight, loved heavy metal music, was his own free bird wherever. He, <laughs> Joe didn't hang out with the crew. He was off on his own all the time but an excellent pitcher and, and made it to the big leagues for a short period of time as well. Uh, Pete Walker and I are still very good friends and we stay in contact. He's now the pitching coach with the Toronto Blue Jays. So we talk probably two, three times a year, and, you know, exchange pitchers and stuff. He's got three daughters and, and uh, but anyway, we had a lot of fun. He was a guy I bonded with. Uh, we were both what I would call athletic pitchers. So we, we like to do, we like to play basketball. We like to run. We like to challenge ourselves, each other all the time doing things. And, and he was a competitive person like myself. We kind of had the same demeanor. I think that's why we bonded. We played in the Arizona Fall League together and we're roommates out there as well. So um, we still stay in, stay in touch. And, and uh, Pete's a year actually in 92 here. Struggled quite a bit as a starter. Um, developed an arm injury um, the next spring training and they put him in the bullpen. And that's where he lit it up that year. I think had 25 saves. Somebody probably has the numbers, but I think he had 25 saves. He became a closer and uh, kind of went from there and then developed back into a starter when he made it to the big leagues with the Blue Jays. So, but uh, no, it was, it was interesting. We had a good crew. We had a manager who hated pitchers still. That's another thing. Steve Swisher hated pitchers, hated pitchers. I, I loved the guy because he was hardcore. He, he got thrown out of a game one time, middle of July, hot, gets thrown out of the game. He was all fired up and his face would get bright red. He was 6'3", 230 pounds, he's a big guy. We sneak into the locker room because we were like, he's going to destroy the place. This is like 20 minutes later. We want to see what happened in the locker room. He's in the uh, training room, shirt off, just his baseball pants on, and I think we had 60-pound weights in there. He's doing curls uh, to get the aggression out. <laughs> so he was, that was interesting that year. Um, and, then, and then we just had the, the person who could work with him was Randy Neiman, who um, I know was a bullpen coach for the New York Mets for quite a while. And Nemo was very laid back, and that's why him and Swish, I think, hit it off okay as a coach who was fiery, and then a pitching coach who was just laid back. And whatever Swish said, okay, we're going to do that today, you know. But, but that was an interesting summer from that standpoint. All right, Steve, let's, let's start with you. Allie Reynolds, Jerry Coleman, Bill Miller, Johnny Schmitz. You joined the team halfway through the season. Tell us about that. Have I got two hours? <laughs> no. Okay. Let me pull up a chair here. <laughs> they didn't bring any beer. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Uh, it all started here, really, at Bay of Tenda uh, when I had a fantastic year. And then uh, uh, I was supposed to pitch on, uh, on a Saturday, but then uh, when I, I woke up and all my teammates, we lived in an old steakhouse. And, they all went to the ballpark before me, and then when I woke up, I asked the owner, I said, you have the newspaper today? He said, no, they didn't deliver it. And I said, oh, okay. So I go downtown John City, and I go to Busy Bee, if you all remember that little restaurant there, it was like a coffee shop, and I asked him for the newspaper there also, and he said, no, they didn't deliver it today. It's kind of odd, and then I go to the ballpark, and 
All my teammates are on the field having batting practice and everything else. It's EJ night. About 15,000 people are going to be there. So then my trainer comes in and he says, uh, don't suit up because your manager wants to talk to you, Phil Page. So he takes me to a little office. That's all we had there at Johnson Field. It wasn't uh, like he had today, a big room like this for a clubhouse and a trading room and everything else. So he says, uh, you're not pitching today because you're leaving. And I says, uh, yeah. He says, where am I going, Kansas City? He said, no. I said, I don't want to go to Birmingham, Alabama. Those are double A teams down south. He said, you're not going there either. I said, well, am I being traded? He said, no. He said, you, then I said, where am I going? He said, you're going to New York. And I went like this to him. I said, oh, come on. You're joking. <laughs> New York? He said, yeah, you're going to the Yankees. I couldn't even talk. Okay. It was unbelievable uh, for me be just pitching two years in the minors, which was class D ball and C ball independence was D ball, C ball was uh, Joplin, Missouri. Okay. And uh, then I started out in D ball with Mickey Mantle and a lot of other good ball players, Bob Weasel, another big left hander. We played two years together. Then I went in the Army, then they sent me here to Bingham, which I fought a contract and they would let me work out at uh, Orangeburg, if you all know that's where the triplets used to train. And then uh, I said I'm not going to sign a contract because I wanted to go to Kansas City and they wanted me to go to Bingham. So Lee Fair McPhail, who was our director of the farm system, he came and met with me and he says, uh, why don't you want to sign a contract? I said, well, I spent two years in the Army, and I felt that uh, I could get more money if I go to Kansas City because there is a cap in every league. Okay, back then, in the Easter League, was $500 a month. If I went to Kansas City, it's $850 a month. He said, well, you know, that's we want you closer to New York. And I go, huh, what are you talking about? You can fly me to New York, yeah. Well, anyway, he agreed. I wanted a clause in a contract, uh, but if I stay 30 days, I'm going to get a $2,500 raise. I figured that's the money I lost being in the Army in the Korean conflict. So he agreed to it. Well, my first 10 wins, six were shutouts. I don't know if you people knew that, and my 30 days was up. So naturally, he's going to give me my $2,500, or I go back to Joplin, Missouri. You know. well, after that, then, the people gave me, I think, about the only ball player in the minor league, Steve Crayley Day, on a Sunday. And then, they were, the two guys, they were, one was Dr. Green and Joe, Joe Generelli, the flower shop owner, and they wanted to give me an automobile, but uh, they didn't have enough time to get me the automobile, so they put two containers on each side of the fence. If you know the old Johnson Field, you come at the first base side, there's they gate, they go to third base side of the gate. Well, people were throwing money into these containers. Jim Finnegan, who was my third baseman later, became a major league ball player also with Kansas City at that time. So he's my accountant, he counted the money, and then the game's over, I won, I beat Redding. Redding never did beat me, okay, all those years. And then they had a good pitcher, Herb Scar, if you all remember Herb Scar, good big left hand. In the last game I pitched against him. Well, I made my speech, and uh, the Naho gang I used to leave in down the right field fence, okay, in for nothing. They gave me a suitcase and everything else. So I made my speech, and I invited, and first I said, you know, my heart is here in the Triple Cities. Uh, this is, I'll never forget it, which I don't even forget, that's why I live here now is that the way the fans were, they treated me and everything else. And I said, uh, uh, our goal always is, all of us here at the table, is eventually we work our way to get into the major leagues. Sometimes it's not that quick, but that, that was quick, uh, I'll never forget it. So anyway, I invited them all over as my guests to Frankie's next door and the other steakhouse. Well, I figured a few people would come, and I said, if you do, I'll get to talk with you and everything else, and we'll, we'll have a few cocktails. 
Well, they all came. I spent twenty-six hundred dollars. Finnegan said, "What the hell's the matter with you?" I said, "It's, it's their money." Now, when I get to New York, okay, and uh, that was a thrill of my lifetime. The, you, know, you take the train to uh, Busy B, and you go to Hoboken. Now, the cab drivers are fighting. Who's going to take me to the Bronx? So finally, he said, "That's him over there." I go with my duffel bag. So they picked me up and took me over. I check into my hotel, and then I go, I'm on the 10th floor, the Concourse Plaza. And then I look out the window and I says, wow, that's it, I'm finally here, you know? So I go down and I call the cab, the cab's right there, and I says, uh, is this cab available? I said, yeah. He takes my bag, he says, where to? I said, the stadium. He said, well, which one? I said, what do you mean, which one? He had the stadium. He said, oh, you must be that rookie. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we go zip, zip, two blocks. We're at Yank Stadium. The stadium I was looking at was polo grounds. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that. So anyway, the teammates, yes, uh, to reflect back on uh, Ellie Reynolds, Vic Ranchi, another good one, Eddie Lopez, Whitey Ford, all of them. Tremendous pitching staff, and uh, Bob Kazava, another big left-hander. I think uh, in our days then, uh, we all came from up from the minor leagues. Today, uh, with the expansion, is buy and sell. You don't really uh, groom the ones here, like here in Binghamton. There's a few prospects that I feel, honestly, should be up there right now and give the opportunity. Somebody on a broadcasting station said, you know, the other go, in fact, I think it was uh, Smoltz. Yeah. He said, what they do today, they bring the youngsters up too soon and not leave them to get their to, career path going and stay in the minors at least a year or two, and then you're ready for it. Uh, I don't think when I was called up, yes, I was a nervous 22-year-old kid. So, I was supposed to pitch on the fourth day, but uh, they sent me back two weeks because all the other ones were grooming me. So finally, uh, Casey sent me down to the bullpen to warm up. And I said, okay, 15 minutes. He said, when you go to Washington, you're going to have your first start. I said, oh, great. So I warm up 15 minutes. All of a sudden, a telephone rings in a bullpen. We were playing the Chicago White Sox. And Ralph Hawk answers the phone, and he says, Crayley, yeah. It's you. I said, no, no, I'm just supposed to throw 15 minutes. I said, no, take a look out there. The old man's got a short, lefty, and I looked over there. Bob Kazama, six foot five. I said, hmm, I guess it is me. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the bullpen back then, I don't know how it is today, but the veterans, okay, they say, when we go in as a reliever, which they were all starters, we don't open that four foot fence, we jump. I said, you do what? He said, you, we jump. That means we mean business. I said, okay, you say so. So I believed him. I did, I heard a lift. I got over with the front foot, but the back foot. <laughs> <laughs> Down I went. So now I'm going, my goodness. Now, they're laughing. I can still hear it to this day. <laughs> so as I'm walking out, and the old man is scratching his head, he says, what is going on here? So as I'm walking, if you remember Mickey Mantle, he fell in that drain in right field. I hit the same drain and I went down a second time. <laughs> and I said, what appearance this is going to be. So I get to the mound, and he, you have to understand the way Stane will talk. He talked jerkish. He goes, well, you, you got to worry about it. And I said, yeah, I, said yeah, I know I just told you to go warm up. I don't want you to get nervous. And I figured this would be a good test to bring you in relief. And I'm, I'm relieving Vic Crash. He's throwing the ball 100 miles an hour. Right. Then he said, the runners are first and third, nobody out. No. You talk about catchers, Yogi, I love him like a father and a brother. He comes down, we go over to signs. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know what he said. One was <laughs> right? two was a curve or whatever. And I said, okay. So anyway, I take a stretch, okay, and I'm warming up, and then I fire the ball. And the first pitch I threw, I hit him in between his so he comes out. 
Yogi never took his mask, so I don't know if, if people ever going to realize that. And here's our conversation. Okay? He says, what did you throw? I said, what did you call? <laughs> he said, well, what did you throw? I threw a fastball. He said, oh. So he goes back. <laughs> Phil Rizzillo comes over to me and he said, Steve, don't, don't get shook up over that. Don't get nervous. Sometimes he forgets what he calls it. Phil, it isn't that. I can't see his fingers. All right? I thought he called a fastball. He said, well, don't be nervous. I said, I'm not. He said, but by the way, before you go, where the hell's the rising bag? He said, you're standing on it. <laughs> <laughs> Behold, the next pitch on me is Chico Carascal, and I beat him. I load the bases. And if I had a recording of what Stengel was mumbling in that dugout, I think I'd have a first flight back to Biggleton. Well, the next bat was Hall of Famer Nelly Fox. I struck him out. I got Rocco Kirsten, struck him out. Got the next guy to pop up. We get out of it. I'm going to the dugout, and here's his exact words. He said, you know, that's what I call being strategic. <laughs> he falls down and everything else, he thought I'd bring somebody that can't pitch. I have a lot more stories, but I thought you'd like to hear that one, and uh, I'm sure that you'll probably ask me later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about Bingham. It's uh, obviously I love the area. I grew up in Iowa, a real small town in Iowa, and, and uh, I don't know if you realize that my hometown, Dyersville, Iowa, is where the movie Field of Dreams was filmed. So that's our claim to fame out there, 5,000 people, and, and that's it. Cornfields all over the place, just like the movie saw. But, uh, you know, very close out there as far as I grew up on the farm, so if, if we were bailing hay, the neighbors were over bailing hay. There's no money exchange, no nothing. When they were bailing hay, we went down there. You got lunch and that's it. You know, it, it just, that's the way it was. I have really found this community. At first, I guess when I came here, um, if it wouldn't have been for the uh, brunette Italian girl, I don't know if I would have spent <laughs> the winters here because that's the only thing about Binghamton I don't like to tell you the truth is obviously the cold. But anyway, the people um, are, remind me a lot of back home as far as, you know, anybody you meet, you say hello and, and people are responsive and everybody's very nice and cordial and is willing to help out, you know, if there is, if you're in a situation, you're out there, somebody sees you, they're going to come help you, flat tire, whatever. And that's what I grew up with and that's what reminds me a lot of home. Obviously the landscape is totally different out there, it's flat as a pancake in cornfields and you get some beautiful rolling hills and trees and stuff here. but. Uh, I, I love the area. You know, I've grown to love it more and more every year. And as far as raising a family, I've got two boys, 18 and 16, and, and uh, live in the Vestal School District, and, and you know, just a great area and great community. That's right now. Well, I was born and raised here, Windsor boy, and uh, spent my whole life. The only time I left was when they shipped me out for wherever I played. You know, eight states, 13 different cities, I think. I've lived in, but I call this home. Two quick stories, uh, one of my, probably the greatest memory I have in baseball was my son Jonah, who's now 17. It was 1997, I was playing for the Bowie Bay Sox, double A for the Orioles. We're in town playing against the B-Mets. My wife is nine months pregnant with Jonah. Um, October, or August, I'm sorry, August 8th, we had a game that night. I lived in Sydney. That's where we lived at the time because my wife is a teacher in Bainbridge Guilford. So after the game, get showered, we drive back to Sydney. I just I went home. And uh, early in the morning, like overnight, Jen's like, I'm, I think I'm going into labor here. I'm like, no, you're not. Come on. She goes, seriously. So out in the kitchen she goes, her water breaks. So I'm like, whoa. Less than three hours later, Jonah was born. Had I been in Bowie, Maryland, I never would have seen it. I was happened to be here when I was with the Scranton Wilkesbury Red Barons. That's where I was playing AAA with the Phillies, and I lived home and just commuted. And my son Jesse was born. Had I been anywhere else, never would have seen that either. So for my two boys, I was home. It was it was amazing, amazing. And are there any police officers in here? Because I got a good story. I was the first <laughs> player that's ever played on Municipal Stadium, B Mets. My buddy and I, uh, it was Thanksgiving Eve, 
The stadium was just a shell. Uh, they had stakes down for where the bases were, home plate, and the mound. So uh, he and I parked out behind the railroad tracks, hopped the railroad tracks with a couple bags. Uh, had a bat, bag full of balls, two gloves, two pair of spikes. So we hopped the fences, hopping trains, looking down, make sure there's nobody there. We get out in the field, we stood at home plate, threw balls up and get them all over the field, left a pair of spikes in the batter's box, a pair of spikes on the mound, a glove there, a glove behind the home plate, and a bat laying there, and just left. And we were just wondering the next morning, you know, when the guys show up to work, like, what is this? So I wonder if there's an archive somewhere in the back room of the Met Stadium if our stuff is still there. But, yeah, so it was the first I ever played on the on the B-Mets uh, field, so that's a, a memory I didn't let out too often. But it was a good time. It was a good time. And just being here in the area when my, my children were born, I happened to be here five hours away with Bowie and an hour and a half away in Scranton, uh, Wilkes-Barre. It's, it's an amazing, amazing place. All right, well, first of all, now I'm number one on the call list for the security company. So if you had done that nowadays, you would have woken me up early in the morning, brought me all the way back to Nice 6 Stadium. So thanks. All right. And uh, as Steve mentioned, it is everyone's goal here at the uh, table to make their way to the major leagues. I spent 17 seasons in Double A. I think I'm pretty much resigned to the fact that I'm not leaving Double A <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, Obviously, growing up in Binghamton has had a major impact on uh, the amount of time I've spent at the, uh, at the ballpark. I was talking to someone earlier, and uh, I think over the uh, 20, 22, 23 seasons of BMET's baseball, I think I've missed a grand total of maybe 40 or 50 games. Uh, starting as a fan in 92, up until working uh, in 98. Um, very few games that I've, that I've missed over the years are for... Uh, I've missed one game maybe in the past eight years, and that was for a cousin's wedding that I was singing at. I tried to do, you know, they, they didn't have Skype at the time, so I couldn't, I, I couldn't miss, I had, I couldn't miss the game. Uh, but, you know, I remember uh, the, the incredible excitement that I had as, a, as an eight, almost nine-year-old when they announced baseball was coming back to Binghamton. And then the incredible excitement that I had as an almost ten-year-old coming to my first Binghamton Mets game. And then my incredible excitement coming back the next day, because the first game was rained out. Yeah. My incredible excitement coming back the next day after that, because the next game was rained out. <laughs> so a few di finally getting to see B-Mets baseball. Uh, and what was better, the first game in Binghamton Mets history was actually a doubleheader. I mean, that's, that's just awesome. Two games for the price of one for a 10-year-old. For a what is what is better than that? And then uh, my first game as a bat boy, I remember... Uh, we had two bat boys on the home side at the time. Uh, you'd be down with the, with the guy uh, at the, at the uh, home plate side of the dugout. He'd train you, and then the next half of the game was yours. Very first, uh, my very first inning, I get ready to go out. Uh, there's a foul ball. I get ready to go out and get it, but then the umpire held up three fingers, which means he needs three baseballs. Turn around, go back, get the baseballs. I'm all set to run out. Play had resumed. Problem is, nobody had picked up the baseball sitting behind home plate. And so they all of a sudden the umpire realized it stopped, stopped the game. Points to the baseball. Great. My first inning as a bad boy, I make a huge, huge mistake. I stopped the game. I even got a couple of boos from a couple of fans. Which, by the way, hasn't stopped now that I'm 32. It was, but it was, probably, it was probably Wegman. <laughs> And uh, by the way, I do love the fact, you know, the 10-year-old uh, child inside of me is loving the fact that my name is now being mentioned in the same sentence as Tom Wegman, and it's not, hey, Connor, go get Tom Wegman a cup of coffee. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate that. Uh, but um, obviously, growing up in Binghamton, I've made a lot of great connections in the Binghamton area that has helped me work my way from that boy up to uh, Director of Community Relations. And wouldn't have it any other way. I'm now, I'm sitting with three guys up here who uh, all have championship rings and, you know, fortunately I get to say this year I get to add one of my own for the Binghamton Mets in 2014. So uh, it's been a great, absolute great pleasure serving the people of Binghamton, being one of you. That's right. Though I have a suggestion for Connor anyway. The reason he's still in double A, he can't get the hot dogs over the big screen. <laughs> So once he accomplishes that, I think we'll move him up to Triple A. <laughs> He'll do a good job.
I call, I call that job security. I don't care. <laughs> well, I, I call it an error. <laughs> Well, I'm originally come from a small town, Whiting, Indiana. I mean, uh, you can hardly see it on the map. Uh, my hometown people migrated from Yugoslavia to Whiting, Indiana, and I grew up uh, really uh, not speaking English, not understanding English, and everything else because my parents didn't know how to read or write and didn't even understand English or whatever. So when I went to school, I had to learn English. And I remember the first day I went to school, the teacher came up to my desk, I had my head down, and she said something to me, and I told her back in Croatian, and what that means, I don't know what the hell you said, okay? <laughs> she said, what did you say? So the other teacher came over and said, why are you hollering at that young boy? He said, well, he said something to me. He said, yeah, he did. He said, he don't understand you. It was a tough thing because when we came home, if I had homework, my parents couldn't help us. We had to learn ourselves. So as I grew up and then played the sports in high school, which in my high school I was a so-called basketball star and a baseball star. And then uh, I accomplished my goal by uh, training myself. I decided to be a pitcher on a baseball team, and I used to have we had a building, it was a concrete building, manufactured building across from our house, and there was a street light there, and what I used to do is uh, draw a target, knee high, a square with chalk. And then I took a tennis ball and my glove, and I used the curb as a pitching mount, and I would throw into that target. And the beauty part of it is, every time I hit the target, the ball is a tennis ball, would bounce different directions, so I would learn how to feel my position once I got into the other phase of a hard baseball. So after that, I was scouted, and uh, I think I only lost like one game in high school for three years. Actually, I pitched when I was a freshman. Well, I went to the University of Indiana for a scholarship, but there was a disagreement between uh, the freshmen, which uh, my other freshman and me, on a fall program. We wanted to play fall ball. He wouldn't let us play. I didn't agree with him. And I went to the athletic director and I says, uh, can I ask you a question? He said, what's that? He says, I'd like to know who recruited me to the University of Indiana. He said, was it a committee? Was it you? Was it the coach or whatever? He said, well, well there is a committee. I said, well, what's wrong? I said, well, I want to play baseball. He says, uh, you won't let us. He said, well, he is the coach. I said, yeah, but I want to play. He says, well, Steve, he says, you know, he's He's the one that makes the decision. I said, well, you're the athletic director. I said, can I ask you a special request? He said, what's that? I want to play the varsity with my eight freshmen, an exhibition game. He said, well, what's that going to prove? I said, well, why don't you call them up and tell them we want to play them. To this day, I could still, I could close my eyes. I could still hear his voice over the telephone. He said, yeah, we'll play them, and I'll teach that cocky left-hander from Whiting, Indiana a lesson. And I said, oh, wonderful, he's going to teach me a lesson. I told my eight freshmen we got our uniforms and we would play. The whole campus came out. We beat them 15 to nothing, and I struck out 19 players. <laughs> now, the reason I tell you that is because I already called my scout, Lou McGuallo, he was scout for the Yankees. He met I said, I'm going professional. I told my eight freshmen, I'm leaving. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm going professional. He said, well, if you're leaving, we're leaving. I said, no. He said, I'm, I'm going to the train station. I had a little duffel bag because I come from a poor family. And that was my luggage. All right? So he came to me and said, well, we made a mistake, Steve. He says, oh, come on. No, I said, too late. I'm going. So I go home, and he's getting there, and I sign. I was a millionaire. I signed for an $800 bonus, <laughs> $90 a month to go play in Independence, Kansas. My father comes up to me, never seen me play. He says, why do you go play baseball? I said, Pa, I'm going to get paid. He said, what do you mean you'll get paid? He said, you go to work in Standard Oil and you're going to make $100 some dollars a week. I said, Pa, they're going to pay me. How much? 
$90 a month. He said, what? No, 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 you go work till you make more money. Well, anyway, it was one of those things that I think all of us here at the table, okay, Joel and Tom, and even Connor and myself, whatever happened was meant to happen and meant to be. So I just figured out, hey, okay, someday I'm going to do something for my mother and my father because in our household, I don't know how everybody's household was back in those days, I lived with four brothers and four boarders in the same house. I slept with two brothers and I was in the middle. I didn't mind the winter time, but summertime, no, I go out on grass. Well, then I remember thinking back, I said, someday I'm going to be something, do something, that I'm going to take care of my mother and my father. And then when I accomplished all my stuff for the minor leagues and everything else, I worked at it, I worked very hard. And then when I made the Yankees, and then we were in Detroit. And then I come out of the locker room, and this uh, first my clubhouse man gave me this note. He said, this gentleman would like to speak to you. Now this was from 1949, okay, when I left the University of Indiana. So I looked at the name, I said, oh, I'll see him. This was the coach at that time at the University of Indiana. So he come to me and he says, remember me? I said, oh, sure do. He says, well, I know it's like five years later. I want to apologize for what happened and we changed the program. I said, I accept your apology. But I want to say one thing to you. He said, what's that? I prayed every night that you could not sleep. <laughs> <laughs> he says, why? Because you prevented me and the other eight freshmen a college education. But I made sure when I came back here in 1956, okay, because I was having the arm problem with a certain virus I had. And I met this, I think all of us here, we meet, uh, every day I think you groom the girls in this territory to get these ball players and trap them and marry them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. I married a beautiful girl. She, she was an orphan, okay. She was in an orphanage when she was 10 years old. It's a sad story, but I don't want to tell you, uh, tell you now. But uh, I think I had the shortest courtship ever because uh, I dated her on Christmas Eve, and the FBI agent that lived with me and my trainer, Donnie Seeger, told me all about what happened to this 10-year-old girl back then. And I said, really? He said, yeah, you better treat her good. I said, no, I will. So I take her to a movie, Big Spender. I take her to the diner where uh, bowling alley used to be Brandywine. We had coffee and pie. Then I took her home to Tunnel, New York, okay, which is right before Harpersville. She was adopted as a foster child by the Italian family, Martusis. And I pulled up and I said, wow, all these cars here? This is where you live? She said, yes. And it's Christmas Eve, right? The Italians, all you Italians, Christmas Eve is a ritual. They come from all over, right? I said, well, that's nice. He says, uh, well, I had a good time, and I hope you did too. I says, uh, I'll give you a call. He said, no, you got to come in. I said, all right. I told him who I was going with. For me, will you come in? I said, okay. For you, I will. I met auntie, uncle, so forth. There's a table like this one here, and all the guys smoke cigars and have play poker. So the foster father's at the end. She takes me to him. Dad, I want you to meet Steve Crowley. And he looked at me, and he, <laughs> he says, you don't look like no goddamn ball player to me. <laughs> she says, I'm not. Well, anyway, I dated her the month of January. I had to go to spring training with the Yankees in 1954 in February. And then I proposed to her on February 4th. I grabbed her hands. I said, will you marry me? And I said, I, said, I want to take you with me. I'm going to spring training. She, like, said to her, smiled and said, you're kidding. I said, no, I'm not kidding. So I said, I need an answer. So I grabbed my hands again. I said, one more time, will you marry me to be my wife for better or for worse? And that to his part, he says, I, I want you to be my wife. She said, yes, cried, knocked me down just about. And then she said, well, I always dreamed as a girl to wear a nice big wedding dress and a big wedding. I said, you pick the month and the date, you get married in my hometown of Whiting, Indiana. And I said, I'll give you what, you, what your dream was about. I did. We had 600 people. 
my cake was six tiers high. Now, the bride and groom that you always put on the top of the cake, well, my baker, a good friend of mine, he put the kitchen's mitt in her hand, and I got the glove, and I'm pitching she caught me. <laughs> I have four children here, okay. Uh, one of the youngest is in Virginia Beach, has his own company. One's a school teacher when you point, and he coaches basketball for the varsity girls. And my son Steve is a manager at BAE, and my daughter Kathy works for the athletic director at John City High School. I love it here. I came back here, and I stayed here, and I, the reason I did it because you and the rest of the fans, you made my career here, uh, especially and a special one for me, the groom, and to be a major league ball player with the finest team in 1953 to win five straight World Series, and the gold ring is on my head. Thank you. All right. All right.